Before we dive in, this week's episode is brought to you by my free cheat sheet, 30 Top Tips to Find Time to Write. In this guide, I give you 30 ways that you can find time to write in the small gaps that appear between the various errands and tasks and responsibilities that you have in your day-to-day -day life. Now, you might be thinking that you don't have any time to spare, but I can guarantee these top tips will give you writing time you didn't think you had. If you thought writing always involved a pen and paper or a keyboard, think again. If you thought you needed at least an hour at a time to write your manuscript, I help you reframe that. You won't be disappointed. Get your free copy of 30 top tips to find time to write by going to emmadesi.com forward slash 30 top tips. Okay, let's dive in to today's episode. Lauka is a European writer, author of micro stories inspired by everyday life, and her historical novel draws on inspiration from Chinese history and her adventures across China. Her writing also reflects her interest in foreign languages and crossing cultures. She's lived in several European countries, can speak several languages and lived for six years in China. She is a convinced supporter of the European Union and she was a candidate to the European Parliament in 2019 with the pan-European party Volt. She put aside political activism to dedicate more time to her writing. She started a blog with Micro Stories in May 2020 and has self-published her first novel, Returning East, in February 2022. I loved speaking to Lau Lauka because I learned so much about her travelling and how that has inspired the writing that she does. Her global view of the world you know, coming from living in so many different countries, as opposed to just her home country, has let her see the world in a different way. And she can bring that experience and bring that point of view to her writing and let her readers live vicariously through her, travel vicariously through her. So if you're somebody who travels a lot and you're interested in using your own experiences of traveling in your writing, then they this may well be the interview for you. So let's dive in and meet Lauka. Well, welcome Lauka. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Emma. I wonder if you wouldn't mind starting off just by telling us about your, your journey to writing and yes. where you are now. Yeah, perfect. Okay, I actually took a couple of uh, classes in uh, creative writing here in Germany, in Berlin, where I live. And uh, after that, after a few months, I decided I wanted to uh, do something with that, with the knowledge that I got from the classes. And I sat down and I said, okay, now I'm going to start to write in, uh, write in a book. And this is what I did. So um, my journey is not... The same as, uh, you know, I hear many, many writers say, oh, I was five years old and I always wanted to write. No, um, I just had time on my hand. I think writing, though, it's a very interesting activity. And after taking the class, I found it particularly um, rewarding. And this is why I started and decided, OK, I want to be a writer. And so is that something that came about over lockdown? With that extra time or before lockdown? It was before. I actually started uh, writing my novel in 2018. Uh, and I started my blog with micro stories in uh, May 2020. So there was, let's say, some preparation behind. Uh, but lockdown on one side was, of course, uh, for me at least, a positive uh, experience because I had more time. I didn't have to commute to work. And that um, saved me at least two hours per day of yeah. commute. And I had time to write as well. So that was uh, actually good for me. Yeah, it's amazing how not having that commute has just opened up so many people's uh, days. Even if you're still working, just not having to do the commute has been kind of life-changing. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Um, now, you mentioned that you started a blog with micro stories. Mm -hmm. um, so for those of us who don't know, can you tell us what constitutes a micro story and what it is about that form that appeals to you? 
Okay. Well, to me, micro stories is a story which is short, obviously. Uh, you know, I consider a short story to be about, I don't know how many words, but let's say six, seven, A4 pages. A micro story is, you know, could be something up to 400, 600 words. This is the least of what I consider. I don't know if everybody has the same opinion. Um, you might actually have uh, micro stories that are even shorter, even, you know, just one sentence, uh, flashes, flash literature. Yeah. I'm not going that far. Um, I started writing micro stories actually in order to establish a writing practice. As I said, I wanted to write, I wanted to write this novel, but I realized, okay, of course, time is always an issue. I have a daily job. Um, and I decided, okay, I have to have a commitment with myself and I have to say that I have to write at least a certain amount of time, if not every day or every week, at least every month. And so I told myself, okay, I want to have a blog. And in, on this blog, I'm going to publish at least two micro stories per month. And uh, this is what I have been doing. So basically, this was uh, for me the option to keep writing. Uh, the micro stories are therefore not particularly, they are not edited or very little with very little editing. It's really, you know, a sort of uh, exercises, you know, the kind of exercise you could also do in a writing class uh, where the teacher tells you, okay, here's a, here's a picture, then write something about the picture. And um, this is what micro story in my blog sites mean. Mm -hmm. um, and it worked very well because now I have plenty of micro stories. I keep the practice. I have newsletter. I have fun uh, and I keep writing. And of course, the writing, the quality of the writing also can improve with time, because if you're writing constantly, then eventually we'll get to um, also honing your skills. Yeah, I think that's so, so important. And what you said about building this writing habit and a commitment to yourself. I think that's so, so key. It's not necessarily, you know, the, the practice of writing is not about the book that might appear two years down the line or might appear on a shelf in the future but it's that practice of making that commitment to ourselves and as you say having fun with it and yeah. feeling this uh, journey of progression and getting better yeah so I love that that's so so important I think for all writers to have that practice yes um so you uh you you sort of you gave yourself some parameters but you feels that you were not rigid about those but knew that you just needed to write regularly and have yeah. two stories a month so given that you do have a day job and a social life and a life you know all the things how do you manage your week or your day with your writing to make sure that you keep that commitment to yourself okay um I have to confess that actually I was in a, a coaching program for a couple of years, uh, which was uh, immensely helpful for that. Uh, and I took uh, away this practice of scheduling my time, which uh, many people might not be uh, very keen to do it, but it, it really works wonder. Mm -hmm. um, so what I do basically is on Sunday evening, I look at the week that I have, I also decide when I want to have free time, you know, making sure that I have time with my husband, uh, uh, that I have, uh, I don't know, I sing in a choir. So I know that I have uh, two evenings blocked every every week. Um, weekends, I try not to schedule anything if possible. And then I decide, okay, what do I have to plan? I know, for example, around, uh, uh, around the 10th of each month, I want to prepare my newsletter. Um, and then I have to look, okay, how many micro stories are already written? Do I have, do I have enough or do I have to write uh, still for the month? Uh, so I, I simply have a look, okay, what do I want to reach this week? N not looking much for, further, j just this week. And I allot time. So I know that I am free after, for example, five o'clock on Mondays and Wednesdays. So do I manage to work one hour before dinner or one hour after dinner? No, I really plan very consciously what I want to do with my time. And when the time comes, then I sit and write. And sometimes, of course, it happens that you don't have inspiration. This is totally normal. It's, you know, depending on what you have to do. Um, you know, each writer probably has its own uh, uh, devices, its own tricks. Basically, I said, okay, it's the five weeks I experienced this week or five things that I, I, 
I've seen this way. And then I go from there. But, you know, I also don't despair if in this allotted time, maybe I'm not exactly reaching the, the wanted result. But if I don't, I always have puffer time. Sorry, buffer time. I like puffer time. That sounds good. German. <laughs> so I have buffer time. And then, of course, because at weekends I don't plan so much, I can always say, okay, this week I did not reach my goal of writing, for example, a micro story. Then I will take one hour more on weekends. So, so it all comes up about being very um, conscious what you want to create and plan for it. And it doesn't have to be three, four times in a row. You know, it just really needs a lot of time, concentrated, one hour. You know that you're going to do it. You're not going to put so much pressure because you have so many other things to do. You know, just just that hour, then you write and you go. And then if it's not enough, you can still adjust your schedule during the week. Mm -hmm. This is what I plan. I might say that I also work four days per week and not five. And this is something I have been doing for several years now, um, which, of course, when I decided to write, that was perfect. Tuesday is my day where I do most of the work. Uh, and I plan, for example, one hour, you know, writing micro stories and two hours working on a short story or doing the marketing you know different activities you know I, I can focus a little bit more on Tuesdays but I do work also on other days as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I 100% agree with uh, scheduling your time it's something I sort of bang on about in my with my audience is that it's not very sexy <laughs> It's not very spontaneous necessarily, but if you're trying to build a new habit, particularly if it's a new habit, scheduling your time, working out what is available to you over a week really does help to take the pressure off because now you know you've got your writing time available, you've made space for it in your week. And as you say, you can sort of come to it with an easier breath, if you like, and just take the pressure off a little bit that you're in control of your time rather than scrambling around trying to find an extra 10 minutes somewhere where you can squeeze in your writing. So I I love that advice about scheduling, blocking time and giving yourself, um, you said, you know, if you don't hit your goal, you give yourself that buffer time, which means that you can not feel pressurized by it, but enjoy it that little bit more. And what you can also do actually is having a baseline. So you say, okay, uh, maybe this week I'm quite busy. Maybe, you know, I won't be able to write as much as I, as I would like to, but let's say at least half an hour, half an hour a week. This is my baseline. And you can also try to play with that. And especially the beginning, if you're, you know, not in the habit that could really help. And um, I had, Something similar when I wanted to take up the practice of yoga and at the beginning was yoga, then was Qigong. I said, okay, I wake up five minutes early in the morning and I do five minutes yoga. And I did that over 20 days time uh, at the beginning, but it was really just five minutes. And then slowly, little by little, actually, I increased. And now I am practicing basically every day Qigong, not yoga anymore, uh, but half an hour. This is part of my day. And so can be with writing. You can say, okay, it's just 10 minutes every two days, for example. Uh, this is your baseline. And then you see where, it, where you're going. Because the more you practice something, the better you get at it and the more you like to do it. Yes. And I, so, yeah, that's great advice about kind of starting small, like with your yoga at the beginning, just doing five minutes, because yeah. then you're it feels then that that's doable. Yes. And you're not going to feel like a big failure if you, you know, you're not yeah. setting yourself up for failure that way. You're just gently easing your way in. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So you built your practice. So thank you for sharing with us that that's going to be useful to a lot of people I know. Um, and so you built your writing practice and you've been doing your micro stories. But I know that you've also written and published your first novel and you published yeah. it this year in February. So congratulations. That's a huge yeah. milestone. Wonderful. Um, where did you get your inspiration for your book, Returning East? Well, um, 
Going back to that moment where I decided to sit down and write a book, I was there with a blank page uh, on my screen and I said, okay, what can I write? I don't know. And of course, I had no idea how to how to build a novel. I didn't outline. I didn't do anything. I was just uh, um, basically brainstorming some ideas. Where should my protagonist be from? Uh, and does he, does he or she go somewhere? And while I was searching for ideas on the internet, I actually stumbled upon a web page uh, about uh, the um, a shipping company, a French shipping company, uh, Messagerie Maritime, uh, which used to actually have this huge ocean liner so traveling all the way to Asia, uh, to, to Hong Kong, to China, to Japan. And I said, well, yes, why not, actually, because... China is my jam, and I said, well, I think it could work. Um, and before I started reading about this, uh, this this company, particularly about one ocean liner, which was called uh, uh, Cambodge, um, and I, I started from there. I took the inspiration from there. So my protagonist starts his journey uh, from Marseille, from the south of France in 1954, I think it was a couple of years after the first uh, trip of this ocean liner and uh, sailed all the way to China. So it was an ocean liner as in a um, a passenger ocean liner, not a container. No, a passenger. Ah. Yeah. At that time, there were passenger ocean liners, yes. <laughs> I think nowadays it would be quite difficult uh, unless you do, uh, how do you call it in English? Uh, um uh, you know, really, this this uh, this journey uh, with uh, with a ship, but at that time it was it was not luxurious, not necessary. It was just a way to go from point A to point B. Okay, so, so not as glamorous as perhaps I have in my head, but um, it feels glamorous though. And so, 1954 is when your book is set, um, and you you mentioned uh, before that China is your jam. So, do you have connections with China? I do. I always wanted to learn Chinese. So when I was 16, I started actually learning Chinese, you know, in one of those courses you take after school. Uh, I didn't learn much, but um, eventually I ended up going to China to study Chinese. So that was my dream. That was 1996. And I learned Chinese. I stayed there for a while. Let's say that in total, I spent six years in China working and uh, uh um, yeah, of course, learning the language. Um, in between, I actually went back to Italy, where I attended university, and I graduated in Chinese language as well. Uh -huh. In Mandarin? In Mandarin, yes. Yeah, I studied a little bit of Cantonese, but I, I've never been able to speak Cantonese, actually. <laughs> um, oh, so that's fascinating. And so where were you based in China? I was based first in Fuzhou, which is uh, a city in front of Taiwan. And I attended um, a course for, for foreigners there. And then I moved to Ningbo, which is a, a, a city south at the time, like three, four hours south of uh, Shanghai. I stayed there two years working as interpreter for two joint ventures. One was uh, a Swiss joint venture, Swiss Chinese and the other Italian Chinese. And then... Uh, that, then I went back to Italy. So first I stayed there three years, then went back to Italy, attended university and uh, got a scholarship to go back to China. And that time I was based in Guangzhou, which is uh, south, uh, north of uh, Hong Kong, uh, let's say now one hour, two hours. I don't know, because mm -hmm. transportation is developing so fast in China now. It's much uh, faster than before. Yeah. And I stayed there for three years. Wow, so it really is your jam, isn't it? It's like your spiritual home almost. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very fascinated by the culture um, and by the history. And uh, this is why, of course, uh, all the experience that I had there somehow had to come out. And uh, this is why in the book, so many of the scenes, of course, are inspired by what I uh, I lived myself there. Yeah. I had some adjustments, of course, uh, uh, considering that I was not there in the 54. Um, but yes, many other things that my uh, protagonist experienced is something that definitely any foreigners having lived there, at least, you know, very early 96, 97, that, that's this is how it was mm -hmm. and so your protagonist uh, you chose to write a male protagonist 
Um, yeah. And how was that experience and why did you choose to write from a male point of view? I realized after that it's unusual. I It was not a conscious choice. Uh, and I think that it might be because it gives me a little bit more distance from the writing. I, I didn't want to, you know, be myself in the book. I didn't want to write about Lauka uh, taking this journey. So writing from the male perspective allowed me actually to have some distance and, of course, use my experience, but not writing an autobiography. Mm -hmm. And so what, what can you tell us about returning east to entice Taste you some readers. <laughs> well, about a journey, as uh, we already said, a journey, a physical journey from France to, to China, to Hong Kong and then China, but it's also uh, an internal journey. My protagonist uh, will have to uh, actually face his past uh, and will have to grow up, actually. Um, it will it will be able to do so thanks of course also to external help in particular uh, the last conversation it will have with his mother will release him free um a couple of reviewers actually defined uh, uh the story as uh, coming of age uh both of them are familiar with american literature so this is why i think this term is very used there um and in a sense it is uh, my protagonist is in early 20s uh, and uh, embarking this journey which to him was supposed to be just bringing something from one place to the other and in the end you know it discovers so many things about himself and about his love his life uh, his past and how he, he can actually decide to change it uh, mm -hmm. and yeah the readers will see whether he's going to change or not <laughs> oh well, that's great thanks for sharing that with us it sounds intriguing yeah um so certainly as a, a, a an english-speaking writer myself i do understand that term of coming of age and some it's a term that i use as well but um one of the things i wanted to ask you about was is a kind of around identity and how we um view the world view our writing um and you know you and i are both well, I'm no longer European, actually. I consider myself a European, but technically I'm no longer European because the UK decided to leave. But um, what does it mean for you to be a European writer as opposed to either a German writer or an Italian writer? Yeah. Well, first of all, Emma, you are still European because you're maybe not belonging to the European Union. The European Union is though a political entity, but otherwise, if we're speaking geographically and we're speaking also from, uh, you know, the point of view of history, you're 100 percent European. So, um, and this is what. To me, being a European writer means uh, it means so that I bring in my writing not only the experience that I had. Uh, in Italy as an Italian. Um, I suppose that most writers will definitely take much inspiration from, from their own culture and from where they live, and especially if they didn't travel much or if their life develops in one country, then of course they tend to write about that country. As I moved so often in my life, I mean, since I was 19 until 2011 when I moved to Germany, so... I think over 20 years of my life, I actually moved every three years and sometimes even moving continent. I lived in Spain. I lived in Belgium, in France, uh, in, in China. As I said, I lived in another city in, in Italy. Um, and then I arrived in Berlin. I fell in love, got married. <laughs> so I'm here 10 years. <laughs> um, but I, I think I can bring in my writing all this experience that I had. Because if I really, it was not just a travel going there, looking around uh, as, a, as a tourist and then writing a little bit about what I, I felt. I was really deep in the culture. And I think this re is a, will be reflected, it's reflected in my writing, in my protagonists, in the use of the languages that I have. Because also in Returning Easter, you will have, of course, the two protagonists that are French. So sometimes there are some French expressions, but there is also some Chinese. Uh, and, um, well, one, one protagonist, one, per, one character is from Holland, but I don't speak, uh, uh, Holland. So, uh, how do you say that? Polish, um, Polish. I don't speak. Not yet. Not yet, Lauka. <laughs> no, I don't think I'm going to get there. <laughs> 
So actually, I was, someone was telling me that it's one of the most difficult languages to learn, which surprised me, but apparently it's very hard, yeah. Which one, sorry? <laughs> Polish, apparently Polish is very difficult to learn. Might be, I didn't try Polish. To me, German was difficult enough. Uh, the German <laughs> grammar was, uh, is still quite challenging, so more difficult than Chinese. I don't, people don't believe me, but I always say, sorry, Chinese is much easier than German. <laughs> Um, so you, yeah, I can see that, that idea of being a European writer and bringing in all those life experiences together. In fact, maybe not even European, but actually being a global writer, given where you've lived and the experiences you've had, it does change our outlook on life. It does change how we see the world and, and view our home countries as well. I think when we've had a bit of experience abroad and seen how other cultures live and view the world and even simple things like, you know, uh, the sort of life work balance or how we raise our children, what we consider a, a good diet. All these things vary depending on where you've lived and can influence our outlook. Yeah. So um, apart from China, because I know you love China, where have you, which other countries have you really loved or have had a, a big influence on you? Uh, for me, France and Paris, where I lived when I first moved, it was, of course, uh, one of the most uh, beautiful time in my life because, of course, I was uh, coming of age uh, and that was, uh, uh, you know, very uh, important to me, um, you know, being independent and working and organizing my life. And I loved Paris. I still love Paris. Um, there is also so much culture. I used to love to go to the Centre Pompidou and, you know, have all those books, uh, you know, at open site. Uh, that was something that was really amazing for me. Um, and I, I do love French culture as well, but I'm not, I think there is no European country where in particular I'm very tied to. Um, I think everything is interesting. In recent times, I'm going often to Spain. I love Spain. Uh, yeah, well, Berlin is cold. Spain is warm. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. And where in Italy are you from? I'm from Torino, from the north of Italy. Okay. Well, that's so, yeah. Oh, lovely. Very nice. I've had a bit of time in the north of Italy, but haven't yet explored the south. So that's something to do. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to change direction a little bit here. Um, so you published uh, your book, as we mentioned, this year. Um, how did you find this independent publishing process and what did you, you learn from that, do you think? Uh, I, I found that the process is very interesting. I mean, I had to learn so many things, uh, you know, um, because, of course, so, you know, being on a budget, you kind of do everything yourself. Um I mean, uh, being a budget, you you tend to do a lot of things for yourself, even though not everything. Um, it was challenging because because I had to really think about all the steps, and I didn't get all the steps right. For example, one of the things I learned is that first you have to have your five hundred percent, two hundred percent sure proofread, a proofread, and everything before you do to formatting because what I did is I was so eager to start preparing and uploading and everything and I started preparing the ebook formatting and uh, uh, print version formatting and then I discovered some more um, uh, mistakes uh, and I had to add a little bit of things here and there and then I, I got really crazy to you know try to actually update both files I mean it, it, it sounds silly but you can imagine I mean if people write they know that you don't have only one file you have maybe 10 other files and you know version one version two version three version four yeah they where is the last one <laughs> <laughs> yeah it is it's a big big job isn't it there's so many hats to wear Indeed. Um, I requested support, of course, uh, um, of an editor, uh, because not being mother tongue, this was uh, one of the most important thing. And being my first book, I decided I also wanted to have structural editing. So I first had a round of structural editing before I went to, uh, into line editing. And I think that was the process also that um, had taught me a lot. Also, 
from the technical point of view, how to organize, uh, you know, the book so that you have the chapters and then you have the synopsis ready. Because then w- when you start doing all the rest, that you have everything in order and it's much easier than to pull information out of it. Um, so that was also uh, an important lesson to learn. Yeah, and- you learn it's not it's not just about the manuscript itself, but all the things that go around the manuscript. <laughs> yeah, and uploading on the different platforms and why it does not work and why, you know, you have to do a PDF done in a certain way. So, uh, yeah, lots of things. And also older marketing that goes behind. I use uh, social media a lot, um, which is not necessarily something that I... I'm very, you know, keen to, uh, well, keen, yes, but um, that I love, let's say, but I learned to do so many things, uh, uh, YouTube channel, Instagram, uh, and Facebook ads. Uh, um, I didn't do any ads for my book because I don't think, I don't have the budget to have that kind of uh, of um, leverage in the end. But I, since January last year, I I do Facebook ads for my micro stories, you know, just to let the micro stories out in the world and, uh, you know, that people can read because they are very short and, you know, they don't have to pay so that at least, you know, people get to know that. Mm-hmm. I <laughs> so, and is that you finding that useful? Is that helping you to build your mailing list and reach a wider audience? Not really mailing list, but I might say because these micro stories are not tied to um, to a newsletter. Of course, I don't get uh, the, mail, the 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 email addresses, um, but I do have much more traffic on my website. Uh, um, and I mean, I never. I'm not in a hurry, you know, of course, I would like to have to to build, uh, to have more, uh, an email list, Um, but well, it will come eventually with time. I have a lead magnet now in place uh, and well, actually since of a time, but maybe it was not the right one. I don't know, but um, yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. And I think um, when you decide well, when you decide to publish a book, whether it be independently or through a, a publisher, you become a business, you become an entrepreneur. And with that comes so many new jobs that it it's really is lifelong learning. So I'm, I'm sure there'll be more to learn with the next book that you put yeah. into the world. Yeah. And, and are you working on a, a next book at the moment or are you taking a break for now? No, I'm already started. Actually, I wanted to start last year, but definitely was not enough time. And for this year, I plan to start in June. But, you know, one day I just said, okay, trying to write something. And I ended up writing letters to my new protagonists. So uh, just um, trying to get to know them and um, we'll see where it goes. I love that you're writing letters to your protagonist to get to know them. What a great idea. I think I'm going to steal that idea. That's lovely. (laughs) (laughs) And so, Lalka, where can our listeners find out more about you and about your writing? Well, I have a website, uh, so it's uh, of course www.lauka. Uh, so L A, uh, sorry, U C A. Uh, that's the web dot eu. So not dot com, but dot eu for Europe. Um, and uh, I have also an Instagram account and a Facebook account. Let me just check uh, briefly. Sorry. Um, so basically, in Facebook. Uh, they have to look for author Lauka and Instagram for Lauka underscore EU. Um, on my website, of course, there are also information about uh, the book, Returning East, and as well as uh, the chance to, uh, there is a link where one can buy the book um, online. It, the print version is available on bookstores if you order it. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Wonderful. Well, I'll be sure to link to those in the show notes. So thank you. Yeah. Lauka, it's been a pleasure meeting you and learning about your writing and your many travels. Yeah, it has been a pleasure to be uh, uh, to spend some time with you and uh, discuss uh, uh, everything about writing. Well, at least some about writing. <laughs> <laughs> 
you're a first time novelist who is struggling to either finish your novel or get those revisions to where you want them to be, then I've got just the thing for you. I have a small group coaching program which runs over 12 months and over the course of that program I will help you fix those plot problems that you've been struggling with. I'll help you get under the surface of your characters so you really get to know them and what's driving them. And crucially for you, I give you that self-belief that you need to get you through the roller coaster that is writing a novel so that you can carry on, get to the end and get your book, your story out into the world so it can change people's lives. If that sounds good to you, if that is something that you'd be interested in doing, I know I can help you get to where you want to be. So book a call with me. Let's have a chat and see if we are a good fit for each other. If you're interested in doing that, then go to emmadesi.com forward slash story builder. I look forward to chatting. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you found that helpful and inspirational. Now, don't forget to come on over to Facebook and join my group, Turning Readers into Writers. It is especially for you if you are a beginner writer who is looking to write their first novel. If you join the group, you will also find a free cheat sheet there called Three Secret Hacks to Write with Consistency. So go to emmadesi.com forward slash turning readers into writers. Hit join. Can't wait to see you in there. All right. Thank you. Bye bye.